Hello, it's a new week and we're back with more Cape Economics. We'll be continuing on our journey today looking at national income accounting. I'm Shanique Francis. Let's get right into it. So, you would recall I shared with you last week the objectives. Now, we didn't complete all of those objectives and so we're going to continue today. So, last week we looked at the circular flow of national income and we also looked at some national income accounting statistics. Specifically, you were introduced to the concept of GDP. So, we are going to look at some other ways of deriving national income statistics this week. But before we do that, we're going to do a quick review of some of the key things that we did last week. So last week, you were introduced to the circular flow model. And we said that the circular flow model seeks to ex explain the flow of money in an economy in terms of income and payments. We also looked at the economic agents that are concerned with the circular flow. And the economic agents mentioned included the households and firms for a two-sector model. And we also looked at the expanded circular flow, which had four agents. And these were the households and firms mentioned before, and also the international sector, as well as government. And we note that whenever the international sector is involved, we say that this is a, an open economy because there's trade taking place. Now, we also looked at the concepts of injections and withdrawals. And we said that in, injections are any additions to the circular flow. And we have a withdrawal when consumers or households earn money that they do not spend on locally produced or domestically produced goods and services. And at that point, we know that they're either saving their income or they're spending it on goods that are coming in from overseas or they're paying taxes. So those are the leakages. I also introduced you to the meaning of the word GDP or gross domestic product. Now GDP looks at the market value of all final goods or finished goods and services within an economy. You were also introduced to the well, one way of calculating GDP, and we looked specifically last week at the expenditure approach and the components for calculating GDP using the expenditure approach included consumption spending, investment, government spending, and net exports. Now, the other ways of deriving GDP includes the income method and the output method. Now, when you're looking at the income method, we're looking at the payment made to the factors or the owners of the factors of production. So this includes wages, salaries, interest, and profits. And also, when you're looking at the output method, now you're simply looking at a summation of the value of the final goods that are produced for the market. Now, one thing that we should discuss is the limitations of GDP. So in last week's class, I had mentioned that when we're trying to make a judgment about how well an economy is doing, one thing that we look at or one statistic that we look at is gross domestic product as an indicator of how well that economy is doing. And I made a comparison to say that we do this with individuals. We look at what an individual earns and we try to make a judgment about the type of lifestyle they can afford or a situation where we're looking at how well they are economically. So if they earn what we consider to be a high income, we, we think to ourselves, okay, they're able to afford basic necessities and also other items. So we looked at the GDP because it will help us to make a judgment for economies or countries. But there are limitations of using the GDP as an indicator of economic well-being, and we're going to explore those now. So one limitation is that it does not include the underground economy or illegal goods and services that are traded. Now, why is this a limitation? If in an economy, we have people who are engaged in illegal activities, right? Say, for instance, I won't mention it, but just use your imagination. So people are engaged in illegal activities and they're making significant income from those illegal activities that they are engaged with. If we do not include the payments made for those illegal activities, 
in GDP, we're getting a GDP that, that is actually lower than the value because it's not accurately reflecting the earnings of the economy. So if a country has a low GDP, and we consider that, okay, based on the population of this country, it simply means that more than likely these people are not able to afford basic necessity. Maybe they're living just below or just above the poverty line. But if most of those individuals are involved or engaged in illegal activities and they earn significant income from those activities such that they could live a luxurious lifestyle, then the GDP would not have given us an accurate reflection of this because it would have ignored the income or the monies earned from those illegal activities. So that's one limitation. Now, there's also a non-payment for do-it-yourself activities. What if we are looking at Jamaica's GDP and we are in some regard, a subsistence economy, meaning that everyone has a garden or everyone is producing most of the items that their household needs. Now, this is not accounted for because when we do things for ourselves, we're not going to the market or supermarket to pay for goods that we are producing ourselves. If you have a farm and you're planting crops and you're reaping and that's how your family sustains themselves by having their meals based on what you've planted and reaped, then it's not gonna be accounted for in the GDP because no one in your family is gonna make a monetary payment for it. It's also similar to a situation where if you have in your household, there's a barber. This barber works at a barber shop where they usually charge people to cut hair, etc. But if that is done in your household to a member of your household, someone gives a haircut, no one is paying for that. So things like that do it yourself activities, they are not included in the GDP. So that prevent, prevents um, accurate, an accurate reflection of what's happening in the economy. Other limitation includes the fact that while a country might be producing goods and services, they may be even experiencing economic growth, which means that when you are doing your comparison year to year or over different periods, you're noticing that there's an increase in the production of goods and services. GDP does not reflect what's happening in the environment. So what if the country is booming in terms of production, but at the same time there is air pollution, they're polluting um, rivers and streams, and that's causing other problems for the economy. The GDP is not going to reflect that also. And the final limitation that we'll mention today is that it does not give you a good indicator of what's happening in terms of changes in the quality of life that's being lived by the individuals of the country. Now, another or two more important concepts for you to know are market price and factor cost. So when you're looking at GDP and other national income statistics, you will see some questions that ask you to calculate at market price or factor cost. Market price looks at the price of the good or service to the end user or the consumer, that's what they pay. On the other hand now, the factor cost looks at the cost at the point of production. So it is not influenced by subsidies and taxes. Now, what are those? And we're going to look at subsidies and taxes next. Now, a tax is a compulsory payment that's made to the state or the government, and that's usually used for running the economy or you know, taking care of different things in a country. However, the subsidy is a payment that is granted to commercial entities or businesses so that they can engage in the production of goods and services that are needed by people within a society. And the government will subsidize these, the production of these goods and services because otherwise they may not be produced and usually they are essential items that are needed within the economy. Now, what happens when you account for subsidies and taxes when we're looking at market prices because the government subsidizes the production of certain goods, it will allow the manufacturers or producers to provide those goods or services to the economy at a lower price because their cost of production would be less simply because it has been subsidized. And if it is a situation where you know, taxes are added, which they usually are, the tax has the effect of increasing the price of goods or services, so think about it. When you go to the supermarket, if you didn't have to pay GCT to purchase the goods that you're purchasing, you would have paid less. So taxes bring up the prices of goods and the subsidies usually lower the prices. 
Now, as it relates to taxes, we want to look at direct and indirect taxes, which we know that direct taxes are usually levied on incomes and profits and indirect taxes are levied on the sale or at the point where goods and services are being sold. And with direct taxes, the individuals to whom the taxes are levied on, those persons have the responsibility of paying the taxes directly, but with indirect taxes, those individuals who are paying the taxes are not paying it directly to the government. However, in that situation, there is another entity that's making the payment on their behalf. We are going to look at the various ways for deriving national income. And this includes GDP, GNP, NNP, DP, DI. So GDP, gross domestic product, GNP is gross national product, NNP is net national product, PI is personal income, and DI is disposable income. Now, before we start our calculation, I want you to take note of this table. We're going to look at GDP at market price and also at factor price. Now, based on the expenditure model that we use, when we are doing the GDP at market price, we're going to look at consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. So, before we calculate GDP at market price, we are going to have to calculate net exports to get that out of the way. So because the table has informed us that our exports is equal to $500 and the import is equal to $100, we know that net exports is $400. So using this example, I've already done the calculation for you. So you can see that GDP at market price is 1050 and we've included the values for consumption, investment, government spending, and net export. And you'll see that calculation there. You can verify it for yourself. To calculate GDP at factor cost, we are going to have to make adjustments for taxes and subsidies. Now, since subsidies have the effect of lowering prices and taxes have the effect of increasing prices, we'll do the opposite to get these cal this calculation or this value that you know, removes the effect of those. So we are going to add the subsidies since it would lower prices and we are going to subtract the taxes since it would increase prices. So when we do this, we'll notice that the GDP at market price, 1050, we will subtract $150, which is the tax paid. And then we'll also add 50, which is the effect of subsidies. And so GDP at factor cost would be $950. We are now going to look at GNP. So when we're looking at gross national product, this looks at the value of goods and services based on what is owned nationally by a country. It simply means if Jamaica is looking to calculate GNP and we own factors of production abroad, we are going to calculate the value of those goods or services produced by that factor of production which we own abroad. So it will be included in Jamaica's gross national product, but for the foreign country, it would be included in their gross domestic product. So if we're calculating GNP at market price, we will find that this will be equal to 1050. To account for the goods that are produced abroad, we have to look at the net property income from abroad. So if we own factors of production 
abroad, we have to look at the income earned from that factor of production. But also, if there are other countries who own factor of factors of production here in Jamaica, we have to send them back their money or we have to remove that from calculation in our GNP because they would have included it in their GNP. And so we look at the net property income from abroad. Add that to GDP at market price and what we'll get is the gross national product. Now to get gross national product at factor cost. There are just a few ways that you can look at getting gross national product at factor cost just to ensure that you remove the effect of subsidies and taxes. Now GNP at factor cost you can get it by looking at GNP minus indirect, indirect taxes and add subsidies or you could use the GDP at market price plus net property income from abroad plus subsidies minus taxes whichever method is easier for you to recall. Now, I have not given you a size for the population, but in case you have a question where you are asked to calculate GDP per capita, you are simply going to divide the GDP by the population. So that's what you would do to calculate GDP per capita. And GDP per capita simply looks at, you know, a measurement of what would the average output be in the economy if we're looking at it per person. So assuming that each person is making a contribution, you know, how does it reflect per person in the economy, the overall GDP? Okay, one thing that I must mention is capital consumption allowance, otherwise known as depreciation. When countries have their factors of production, specifically capital, when they are used daily, yearly, or whatever period they are used, over time things get worn out. So you have to make an adjustment in your GDP to take account for the fact that you have to replenish these machines, either upgrade them or purchase new one or fix, fix those that are worn out. So that's why we have an allowance for capital consumption. Now, when we're looking at net national product, which is also called national income, so if you have a question that asks you to calculate national income, they're actually asking you specifically to look at net national product at factor costs. Now, we're going to do the net national product at market price first. And the net national product at market price is to use your GNP and to subtract depreciation, which you are seeing in this table. So our GNP minus depreciation would leave us with $1,050. That would be your NNP at market price. We look now at calculating the NNP at factor cost, which as I mentioned before, is the same thing as your national income. So what is the difference? NNP at factor cost, you can simply use GNP at factor cost and then subtract depreciation. Remember that any question that's asking you about factor cost is really asking you to remove the effect of subsidies and taxes. And you'll do this by, do you remember? So if taxes increase price, you have to subtract taxes. And since subsidies lower prices, you have to add those subsidies. So your NNP at factor cost or national income is equal to $900. I hope you're following so far. All right, so... Another statistic that we look at is the net domestic product, also called NDP. So net domestic product looks at GDP minus capital consumption or depreciation. So you recall that when we calculated GDP at market price, this was equal to $1,050. So our NDP is that $1,050 minus $100 that we have allocated for capital consumption or depreciation. I want you to look at this table 
And as I'm going through these and we're almost finished with some of these calculations, I wanted to recall, you know, what formula or what the formula is for each and to look at the, the table clearly. See if you can double check to make sure that what I'm telling you is the answer is indeed correct. So we're looking at personal income now. And what you'll find as you work through some of the questions is whatever provision is made there for the formula, sometimes you might not see some of these figures. So for example, the personal income is equal to national income, which is also called net national product at factor cost. We will subtract retained earnings and we will look at the income received by the government. So for instance, corporation and taxes, plus we'll add transfer payments. And if you remember what we did last week, I would have said that transfer payments are, for example, welfare payments that are made. Now, since we have the net national product at factor cost, which is also national income, we're gonna look for the other figures to calculate personal income. We will look at the table and realize that we don't have transfer payments, we don't have corporation taxes, but we do have retained earnings. And so we'll subtract that from the NNP at factor cost. And then this will leave us with our personal income. Then finally, we have disposable income for our calculation. So when we're looking next at disposable income, it's personal income minus personal income taxes. I wonder if you recall seeing any personal income taxes in the table. So the personal income that we calculated was $800 and the personal income tax here would be $150, which is the income tax. And so the disposable income figure that you should get is $650. Now, before we move on, I want to just go over some of what we've done already and then we'll go through some revision questions for you. So if you're just joining us for any reason, we are doing module one, topic one of unit two. Our topic is national income accounting. And so far last week, we started this lesson. We looked at some key things last week. So we looked at the fact that macroeconomics looks at what's happening in the economy as a whole or on a whole, right? So it looks at things that takes place among different economic agents. It looks at the government decision-making, household decision-makings, firm decision-makings, and also how the international sector affects what we do as an economy. So we looked at the fact that there are four macroeconomic objectives. They include inflation, economic growth, balance of payments, also called BOP, and unemployment. We were introduced to the circular flow model, which looks at how money flows in an economy between the different economic agents. We looked at the two-sector model, which we say involve households and firms, and we say households own those factors of production that they will sell to firms and firms will pay households for those. In addition, firms also, while firms demand those factors of production from households, they also supply households with goods and services. And while households supply the factors of production to firms, they also demand the goods and services. So we notice that the concept of the circular flow is that money will go from the firm to the households for payment of factors and from households to firms for payment of goods and services. We also looked at the expanded circular flow because we said based on the two sector model that we examined last week initially, that when there is no involvement of the international sector, then it means that the economy is closed because it's not trading with any other country. We looked at the four sector model, which included international sector, which we said once the international sector is involved, it means that we're exporting and importing goods and this is an open economy. We looked at the fact that the government plays a role in the circular flow, the expanded model or the four sector model where 
The government collects taxes from households and firms and also makes payments to households and firms. And I wonder if you remember what those payments are. So the government makes payments to households in the form of welfare payments or transfer payments. And the government also makes payments to firms in the form of subsidies, which allows them to lower the cost of production. So these are some of the things that we looked at last week. In addition, one very important thing we looked at was the concept of gross domestic product, which we said is a market value of final or finished goods and services in an economy produced in a given period of time. Now, today, I also introduced you to the limitations of that concept of GDP. Just the mere fact that you can't just look at GDP to make an assumption or judgment about the well-being of an economy because it doesn't factor in something. It doesn't factor in earnings from illegal activities. It doesn't factor in environmental damage that's been caused due to the production of goods and services by different companies. And we also said that it doesn't take into consideration the fact that people are doing things on a subsistence level. They're providing goods or services at the level of their households, which they are not going anywhere to pay for them. So the GDP does not include some of these things, which it could misrepresent how well um, people in an economy are doing in terms of what they are able to afford and what they have access to. Today, I also introduce you to the different ways of deriving national income. So last week, you heard of gross domestic product. This week, you heard of gross national product, net national product, national income, which is also a net national product at factor cost, personal income, net domestic product, and disposable income. And two things that were distinguished as it relates to those statistics were market prices and factor costs. And we said that market prices looks at the price or prices paid by the end consumer or customers, while factor costs looks at the cost at the point of production and it removes or does not, it's not influenced by taxes and subsidies. So we looked at those different ways of deriving national income by using the market price and factor cost. And I'd suggest for you that you could just make a little formula sheet for yourself where you can look at to help remember how to calculate these different statistics. Now, are you ready for the revision? Because I want to see if you have been paying attention. Now, first question, and I hope you didn't see the answer a while ago. The first question is, what are the key issues of macroeconomics? Do you remember? Because I mentioned them earlier when I was doing the recap. So is it unemployment, inflation, economic growth? Is it a situation where you're not seeing any of the things that are macroeconomic issues? Are they all included? And when you are answering your multiple choice questions, just a quick tip for you. Now, one thing you can do, one strategy that will work for a multiple choice question is for you just to remember that there's only one correct answer. There's usually an answer that's the distractor. It's close to the correct answer, and so it's there to throw you off. If you meet a question in a multiple choice test or exam, make sure you answer all questions. If you are seeing a question or if you see a question that you're not certain about, it's better to just take a chance and choose one response rather than to leave it blank. You're basically giving away your marks there. So for this question, the first thing that you will start to do or for any multiple choice question is to use an elimination process. You examine the question and you say, okay, what would definitely not be the answer? And you start, by doing that and then you will eventually work your way to the correct answer or you'll narrow it down to make it easier for yourself. So if you recall, I mentioned this last week, the key issues of macroeconomics are also, they might refer to them as macroeconomic objectives. And I mentioned four of them and three of them are here. So we know that the answer for this question is all of the above. What I had mentioned is unemployment, balance of payment, inflation and economic growth. 
the economy is always going to try to produce more so that it can grow and earn more income. And the goal of looking at unemployment is to make sure that unemployment is at low levels. So as much as possible, persons within the economy are fully engaged and inflation should be stable and predictable. It shouldn't be high inflation or hyperinflation. So the correct answer for this question is all of the above. So our next question, true or false? Now, this question says, in the circle of law of income, savings is an injection and investment is a leakage. Now, when you're looking at this question now, you have to consider to yourself, or how I would suggest you approach this question is, think about it. What are injections and what are leakages? Do you remember all the injections and leakages? So if we're looking at injections, remember it's anything that introduces income into the circular flow. So for an economy, injections would include government spending and that's one and i wanted to recall the other forms of injection you look at the two things that are mentioned here savings and investment would savings take money from the circular flow and if we say if we said that a leakage is something or it's a situation where income earned is not being spent on domestically produced goods when people are saving are they spending it on domestically produced goods or could savings be an injection? When you're looking at savings, you know, is it introducing money into the circular flow? But the question is saying, in the circular flow of income, savings is an injection, so it's introducing money. And it's also saying that investment is a leakage. Is this correct? Does investment take money from the circular flow and does savings add money to the circular flow? Right? So based on this question, the answer is false because Savings is a leakage and investment is an injection, but the savings said that investment is a leakage and savings is an injection. The next question now. In an economy, when a steel producer sells steel to an automobile producer, is it regarded as a final good, an intermediate good, an injection, or a leakage? Do you remember when we looked at intermediate goods last week? So the correct answer for this question, if you guessed intermediate good, you are correct. Because the steel that is being produced is not the final good. The intention is that it will be used to produce another good, which would be considered the finished good. So for that reason, the steel is considered to be an intermediate good. Next question, we're back to leakages. So it says, leakages from the circular flow are dash, dash, and dash. Now, if you were listening earlier, I would have already given away this answer or given away some components or some examples of leakages. So we identified from the previous question that savings is a leakage. So we'll use the, the process of elimination there. So looking at the questions now, we know that savings is a leakage from our previous question, and we know that investment is an injection. So any question that has in investment would not be correct. So we could right away eliminate options A and C because they include investment. So let us look further now based on what I already said. So savings, taxes, net of subsidies, and imports, are those removing money is from the circular flow. And if you said yes, you are correct. So the option here, the correct option here is B. So the next question is injections as it relates to the circular flow. It's a similar question. So we use the process of elimination. We know that any question with, um, let us identify one, injection or rather one leakage and we can eliminate that question looking at how the question is set up so the correct answer for this question is c when there's government spending when there's investment when there's exports all of this will introduce money into the circular flow another question now gdp adjusts 
for net property income. Is this true or false? And let us look at the answer quickly before we go. So the answer is true. So thank you very much for paying attention and participating in the lesson today. I know that you are at home answering these questions. So that's all we have time for today. And we have been discussing national income in Cape Economics Unit 2. And I really hope you've understood the points that we discussed today. You can catch a repeat of today's lessons on JNN at 4 p.m. in class time. Highlights of this week's program are also available on Saturday between 1 and 4 p.m. and on video on demand on One Spot Media. We also have a new channel devoted to students of all ages called School Time, and this can be found on One Spot Media. So check it out. If you have any questions, please remember to send them through the Ministry of Education and also Television Jamaica's social media pages. We want to make sure that you are understanding what we have taught. Remember to keep safe. I am Shanique Francis. <laughs>Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited.